MedShield. Embracing our members in good health since 1968. SMS MedShield to 33023 or talk to your broker to get your kind of care. Epilepsy is not a case, nor is it anything to fear. For help, contact Epilepsy South Africa. Approximately 50 million people currently live with epilepsy worldwide, making it one of the most common neurological diseases globally. Now, globally, an estimated 2.4 million people are diagnosed with epilepsy each year. It affects people of all ages worldwide. Now, epilepsy affects one in every 100 South Africans, but fear, discrimination, stigma, and misconception still surrounds this condition. Now, National Epilepsy Week is recognized annually from the 12th to the 18th of February. It aims to raise awareness about epilepsy and gather support for people with epilepsy. So how much and what should you know about this condition? Is it curable? Can people living with epilepsy, for instance, play sport, drive cars, get employed? Now, how would you know if someone is having an epileptic seizure? And if it does happen in front of you, what would you do? Well, stay tuned because today we unpack all you need to know about epilepsy. And to help us with this, we have an expert panel comprised of a professor in neurology from Vets University, the vice chairperson of Epilepsy South Africa, or EASA, a social worker from Epilepsy South Africa, a child living with epilepsy, an adult living with epilepsy, a mother of a child living with epilepsy, and an epilepsy activist and the founder of Timul Law, home for children with epilepsy and disabled children. You may want to be part of this show, as always, by asking the panel some questions or simply just sharing your views with us. The number to call in that case is Johannesburg, 714-6918 or 6919. You can also tweet us at SABC Health Talk or simply interact with us on our Facebook, SABC Health Talk. So sit back, relax, and learn from this bumper show ahead. Coming to you after just a short break. I'm Dr. Salomon Daung, and this... Is our talk. At MedShield Medical Scheme, we don't just talk health. We do help. SMS MedShield to 33023 or talk to your broker to get your kind of care. News at 9. We go beyond the headlines of the day's breaking news to bring you all the angles and in-depth analysis of stories. We go beyond the surface, including on how it will impact your life. Join us every day at 9 to zoom in on the day's big stories. MedShield, embracing our members in good health since 1968. but I'm known with Dito. My name is Duli. I'm 22 years old. And um, I was diagnosed with epilepsy in 2014, September. And for me to find out that I, I got, I got uh, epilepsy, I went to Ranbury Clinic. I used to go every month for my asthmatic inhalers. So I went there. I just explained to them that I'm, ha I'm fitting at home. So they asked, like, what kind of fitting I'm having. I'm shaking or whatnot. I have to ask someone to like observe me when I'm having that thing and take notes. And then okay, I went back home. It happened other day. It happened at the clinic. So that they like they decided to call the ambulance. I was admitted to Helen Joseph, 
when I get there, they run all the tests and the EEG, and then the doctor told me that I have to start taking Epilim to control my seizures. I asked what is causing that. He said he don't know, but we have to do more tests. And then I went back home the following month. I went for a CT scan and also EEG. And then the doctor said, you have to keep taking this medication. It was uh, Epilim CR 400. It was a high dose for me because if I, I took it, like I will feel dizzy, tired. Like I won't be able like, to walk on my own. Like I will start like shaking and collapsing. I went back to hospital. I was also admitted for three days. Then like they reduced the dosage. I took CR 200 grams and 50 grams of Epitech. I keep going to hospital because like, I was just stressing, I couldn't accept it. What is causing it? Why now? Because at home, I don't know like if there was someone who had epilepsy or what. So the doctor said the cause is, is unknown, but the trigger, I have to like write down what, hap what happened before I have the seizure. So they gave me an epilepsy diary to record all my seizures and what time, like, how long they, they took and uh, what happened after. So I kept that diary with me every time when I'm going to see the neurologist, I used to take it with me. So get to the point is like what was triggering is what is stress and pressure and tired. So all the time when I'm tired or stressed, I used to have seizure and I started like monitoring that. So since last year, September, I, ha I didn't have any of the seizures. That is what is the best. And other thing, it was so hard for me because where I'm staying, people, they, they couldn't understand what's going on with me. Some people are like, ah, this one is demonic possessed or whatnot. So like, it was so hard for me even like to like share with other people that I'm epileptic and it was very hard. Hmm, okay, that's one full account of epilepsy, but we're going to hear more about that. But to help us understand a lot more about what this condition is about, it's a pleasure to welcome our guest studios, uh, our guests in studio today. First up, Professor Girish Moody. Uh, Prof. Moody is a specialist neurologist and head of neurology at Wirtz University. Welcome to Health Talk. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. All right. And in the middle, we have Mohammed Kasim. Mohammed is the Vice Chairperson of Epilepsy South Africa. Welcome to Health Talk. Thank Mohammed. you, Doc. All right. And last but not least, Max Millen van Heerden, who is an epilepsy activist and is going to tell us about, you know, what he does in his activism on this condition. Welcome to Health Talk. Thank you for having me. All right. Let's start with you, Prof. And, and perhaps, yeah. you know, let's start by dealing with these basic definitions, convulsions, fits, epilepsy. What, what are we okay, doing? So, so it works like this. Epilepsy is, is probably the most interesting neurological, if not medical, illness. Mm. And, and we sometimes call it an illness and we call it a disorder, but it differs from everything else in the sense that you know, it's generated by a storm of electricity in your brain. Mm. So it's easy to understand something like stroke, mm. where, you know, a part is damaged, or a tumor where something is growing and damaging tissue, mm. and the effects of that would be a paralysis or weakness on one side of the body. This is a completely different thing. This is something where there's something in your brain that triggers of an electrical storm that infiltrates the entire brain mm. and what we saw on your clip is the effect of that okay so we're going to what come we back call to that is, yeah. is effectively a seizure right so you get a seizure a fit or a convulsion those are synonymous okay those are so one and the same thing all okay yeah all right and then epilepsy is the disorder where someone has recurrent unprovoked seizures so I, th I think those are the important things. Can, it, can you have a seizure that's not called epilepsy? Yeah, yeah. So uh, we, we, th this becomes the issue of discussion and debate. Mm. And you can. Any, it, it is stated, which we may debate, but anyone can have a seizure, mm. right? Provoked under certain circumstances. So the brain can be provoked into that electrical storm if you for instance, dehydrate the person, starve the person, or subject, you know, like sometimes you see in the movies where they're torturing someone, mm. that kind of situation, sleep deprivation can even do it. And sometimes in diabetics, when the sugar drops a little bit too low, mm. they can convulse. Okay. That but that's doesn't not make them mean. epileptic. All right. Or so how, how common is this condition and who gets affected? So, so epilepsy is, is probably globally about Two to five percent of the world's population have epilepsy, mm -hmm. which, according to like your number there, 50 million is about right. Mm -hmm. That's a huge number of people that get it. 
Uh, we divide them into two groups. The ones where we don't identify a cause, it doesn't mean there's no cause, we don't identify a cause with current technology. Mm. And in the one group where we know what's causing it or triggering it. Mm. And we're looking at 80% unidentifiable and 20% identifiable. Mm. So this is the group of what we call idiopathic. Mm. You, you know we doctors are very clever, we make up <laughs> words for this. So idiopathic, when, when we don't know. We don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so right. we call this idiopathic epilepsies. Right. Right. And so uh, you divide it like that, and uh, that you're doing in terms of cause. Right. But the exciting part is in terms of the manifestations. Right. right. Well, talk about we'll manifestations about then. Yeah. then then there's obviously, diff we hear there's different types of yeah, 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 epilepsy yeah, yeah. in terms of how, how it presents. Exactly. Just take us through the differences. Okay, so we, we, gener we classify the epilepsies into the generalized ones and the partial ones. This is the most important thing to remember, mm. right? The generalized ones kick off with loss of consciousness. So I think your clip showed it where suddenly this woman falls down, boom, boom, and things are happening. So it always starts with loss of consciousness. You don't know it's going to happen. You cannot predict it nothing it's completely unpredictable that's the generalized ones mm. the partial ones we have two types we have the simple partial and the complex partial mm. in the simple partial you are completely awake you have no loss of consciousness but you have sensations so you can have a motor movement you can have a face twitching you can have a sensation going down your body things like that the complex partial you have loss of awareness so you're not completely gone. And so sometimes the epilepsy sufferer comes to you and says, listen, doc, I can hear everybody speaking, but I can't do anything. Mm. And it's, it's actually true. He has loss of awareness. He's not unconscious. And those are the guys that have the aura or warning. Mm -hmm. So they get the smell, the taste, the bad taste, the funny sensation in the stomach. Mm. They, get, they get the auras in which you know it's going to happen. And of all these different types, which is the most common? The generalized, generalized ones are, are the common ones. All right, let's invite some comment here from Mohammed. Mohammed, firstly, tell us about Epilepsy Awareness South Africa. Okay, so Epilepsy Awareness South Africa was founded in November of 2015 right. by our current chair, Linda and Maximilian. And the reason they founded it was to raise awareness for epilepsy mm. and get the message out there that it is, you know, a, a disease that you can live with and you can have a normal life with. Mm -hmm. So our aim for epilepsy awareness is to facilitate support groups and do road shows and talks out there at schools um, and r raise awareness and run campaigns surrounding epilepsy and mental health disorders. Mm -hmm. And, and talk about awareness. I mean, in my introduction, I, I spoke mm -hmm. about stigma and discrimination. Yes. Do you still find a lot of that? Yes, you do find a lot of stigma, discrimination, stereotypes. You know, um, as the club said, that, um, that the lady said she was, you know, it was a demonic thing. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not a de demonic thing. It's a medical neuro neurological condition mm -hmm. that can be treated. Mm -hmm. So you get a lot of that stigma and, you, you know, the message is not out there of, how epilepsy can be treated and what can be done, and that you can actually have a normal life with that. Okay. What about you, uh, Maximilian van, van Heerden? Um, you, 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 you are known to be an epilepsy activist. Yes. We believe that you yourself don't have epilepsy. No, I don't Just have epilepsy. Just tell us a, a little bit about what motivated you to, to become an activist. Well, my mother lives with epilepsy. Right. Um, and when I was much younger, when I was around nine years old, I did charity work at an epilepsy care centre. Mm. And after a while, I decided that I should do something to help them and do more awareness for epilepsy, because a lot of people don't know what epilepsy is. So, so where do you do most of your work? I would imagine you're still at school? Yes, I am still at school. Mm -hmm. um, most of my work I do in the holidays. So I'll go to Patapaleng home, um, which is an orphanage, and a few children there have epilepsy. And then I also do charity work at a care centre in Craigle. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, that's what I do there, is charity work. Okay. So, so do you speak to, to a whole lot of other people that don't know much about epilepsy? Tell us about the school environment especially, I'm interested in that. Do, do you speak to your schoolmates and what sort of responses do you get there? In school, a lot of people don't know what epilepsy is, mm. but in one case, a person in my class had an epileptic fit and no one understood what to do. Mm. 
mm. how to help this person and they think that you should stick something in the mouth, that is a no. Mm. You don't ever do that because someone can trick. Um, and then I do tell a lot of people um, what epilepsy is and how to help people, those who are living with it. <coughs> mm. Great work. Mohammed, let me just come back to you here. So, so let's hear about your own personal story. Okay. You, you're living with epilepsy. Yes, I'm living with epilepsy and mild cerebral palsy. Mm -hmm. um, I was diagnosed with epilepsy when I was six years old. I had a head incident where I knocked my head against some granite. and some? Against some granite, okay. a granite top. Right. And um, about two weeks later in my sleep, my mom realized that I wasn't responding and I wasn't, you know, I was dazed and whatever. So they took me to the bathroom thinking I wanted to throw up. Um, and then after that, they realized, okay, there's something else wrong. So they took me to the hospital immediately. And from then, I've been having epileptic attacks. Um, my last epileptic attack actually happened in, when I was in school, which was about five years ago in grade 11. Um, and I was actually that boy in school that had the attack. So I related to his story there. Um, so, you know, um, it, it's, they got, the school got the ambulance out to me and all of that, but a lot of people still didn't know what to do. And it was since then that I had this notion that, okay, I need to actually get this message out, because even my closest friends didn't know what to do, mm -hmm. um, because I hadn't had an attack since then, so before that, about, you know, five years before that. Okay. And, so and now you're attack-free? About five years, yes. I'm okay, sure. well. Well, Maximilian and Mohammed, thank you so much for your time, and I can only wish you the best, man. Thank you. All right, Thanks. time for a quick break. When we come back, we now try and focus on understanding what causes or triggers this condition called epilepsy. Please stay with us. Shield Medical Scheme. We don't just talk health, we do health. A warm welcome to one of your favorite weekly review analysis programs, Media Monitor. So let's look at the race itself. It's just becoming a personality contest where people just want somebody to guard their own vested interest. And I feel that the country's at a point now where we need some sort of change. It is ANC policy that they will have to implement. We fairly know the direction the ANC wants to take. As a leader, you have to implement. So what was it like on the ground in Kenya? Well, the country is divided. The country is very divided. I think within the country for me, the one person that I criticize severely and I'm not very happy with his approach is Raila Odinga with him pulling out. Stay tuned to Media Monitor and catch on analysts unpacking top stories every Sunday from 9 a.m. At MedShield Medical Scheme, we don't just talk health, we do health. Welcome back. We're talking epilepsy, and uh, with me in studio is Prof. Girish Moody, head of neurology at Vets University. And we're now joined by two other special guests. First, Tanya van Heeren. Tanya is um, somebody who's living with epilepsy. Uh, welcome to Health Talk, Tanya. Thank you for having me. All right. And next to Tanya is Lebohan Ramushu, who's founder of Timolo Home for Epilepsy and Disabled Children. Correct? Thank you, yeah. Welcome to Health Talk. Thank you for inviting me. All right, we're going to come back to you, but, but Prof, let's, let's start talking about or at least understanding what causes epilepsy. Earlier you said we don't know in most, in most yeah. cases. So but what are the risk factors? Yeah, you know, when we say we don't know, it's not that we don't know, it's we can't identify, mm. right? Uh, we, we do know that, you know, I have this, like, uh, way of explaining to my patients. So this is your timeline. This is birth. And what happens before birth are all the environment, the developmental issues, mm -hmm. right? With the developmental issues, you can link genetic issues mm -hmm. and sometimes environmental factors. Mm -hmm. So the developmental issues are 
you know, mother has a bad pregnancy or mother did bad things in a pregnancy or whatever. Mm. And those give you a risk for developmental factors. Right. Then there are the genetic factors. And obviously, there's a small percentage of patients with epilepsy who have genetic epilepsy. Mm. And the, there's a gene that, you know, many genes that have been identified. And so there are these genetic factors. So you take those two and then you take the risks that go around birth itself, mm. right? And we might think in majority of patients, you know, woman delivers baby, we think it's one, one, two, three, done, you understand? Mm, mm. But lots of things can happen, can happen lots yes. of things can go wrong. True, true. Fortunately, they don't, right? Yeah, yeah. But so we call that the, 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 the sort of perinatal right. factors. Right. So you take all of this together and you will end up with a risk. The majority of us, the risk is low enough to live our lives well without anything. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Then you get a small percentage, these 5% that we talk of, that have that risk, and then as they go through life, something triggers them. Mm -hmm. So it's like the kids uh, between the ages of 2 and 5 who get fevers, and they get the pyrexial convulsions during that. Mm -hmm. Or you get a child who has some deficiency in the neonatal period, something like a paradoxin deficiency or some, some kind of deficiency that will trigger the seizure. So, so, so the trigger, essentially, we're talking about two types of triggers. A, a trigger that will trigger development of the condition, yes. ep, the chronic condition, yes. epilepsy. That's so that's a one type of trigger, yes. And, and within that... Then we got the, the factors the, that can initiate the, the concussion. Okay. So, so, so then we, we divide these, so that's why I'm coming to causes. Right. So we divide this according to age of onset. Right. So the early onset epilepsies can be either benign or very bad, right. right? So you get those conditions, you've heard of the infantile spasms, the very bad lennox gastaut syndrome, the cerebral palsy-related epilepsies, the bad developmental disorders, etc. cetera. Mm. They're in that early phase. But then you also in the early phase get the benign ones, like the pyrexial epilepsies, mm. right? And then you go from five to 15, mm. and all the causes there relate to relatively benign the generalized forms, right. right? And then you move into the adult types, and there you'll get the brain tumors and the strokes that could be a cause. But again, the majority are those group which we called idiopathic, yeah. right? So that's how we, 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 we spread out the epilepsies. In terms of the, the risk factors or the triggers, right, the common ones, so you know, let's say I have epilepsy, right. what will trigger me? lack of sleep. So remember in your clip the woman talked about fatigue. Mm. Fatigue is related to lack of sleep. Mm. Right, and sleep deprivation is the number one factor. Right, or disturbed sleep or whatever. And this is becoming a big issue because of traveling. Mm. And so you go, you, have, you know, you go across time zones, you mess your brain up. That's right. right. Yes. Okay, that's number one. Number two, toxins. Right, and, and the common toxin is alcohol. And alcohol is a no-no with epilepsy sufferers. And in fact, especially the binge alcohol. Mm. So as soon as they withdraw, they're going to fit, mm. right? The other toxins, and, and someone will come up with cannabis, but I can discuss that with you if you want. Um, and then there are the, 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 the illnesses, like the fevers, yeah. they can be triggers. Then very important in children, flashing lights, yeah. right? The photic uh, drives that you can get. And, and then the general metabolic triggers. So there's lack quite, of quite a range yeah, of it's stuff. a range. Yeah. So, you know, an epilepsy sufferer should never drop the sugar. Yeah. An epilepsy sufferer should never sit in the sun the whole day and dehydrate. You know, logical, logical triggers. Okay, let's, let's move across to, to, to um, Lebohang. Lebohang, you you founder of Timur Home for the Disabled Children and Children with Epilepsy. Just tell us a little bit about what, what is it that you, the home is for and what okay. you do there. Um, Timolo is where the disabled uh, kids stay. Um, it's January to December. Um, you know disability, it comes with epilepsy as well. You know when you're disabled, there's a maximum of you being at high risk of epileptic. So they, <coughs> they take medication just to control that. Okay. So most of our kids, 70% are epileptic. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what sort of age range are they? Um, it starts from, I think, 2 yeah. to 30. And, and they live full-time with you? Full-time, yes, 24-7. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And where is it, if people want to know where this home mm, is? Timor Law is in Galfantine Midrand. Right. Yes, yes. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. We'll get more about you know the actual details, but let's speak to um, Tanya. Tell us about yourself, your journey with this condition, epilepsy. Um, I was seven years old. I was at boarding school, and um, they diagnosed me with epilepsy. Mm. At the time, it was called petit mal, but it's a seizure that you don't notice because mm. it's more like a daydream. Mm -hmm. I was very fortunate to have good teachers that could recognize that. And that's almost 40 years ago. Mm. So I had my tests and medication. They said I would grow out of it. I don't recall having a seizure. Um, so if a day, I have a lot of daydreams even as an adult, mm. but it doesn't mean I'm epileptic anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, it did affect my schoolwork and mm. it did affect um, a few other, you know, sort of development issues or friendships and things like that, mm -hmm. because obviously it would got around that I had something different to the other kids. Right. But nothing <laughs> too serious. I was just lagging behind in schoolwork more mm -hmm. than the others. Mm -hmm. Later in life, um, my child is Maximilian, so later in life, uh, being a scout leader and my son being involved with scouts, you have to do a lot of community service. Mm -hmm. And with that, you end up becoming an activist. <laughs> right. That's how Maximilian got involved in that. So mm -hmm. he not only did mm -hmm. um, flash mobs at Santon City illegally, mm -hmm. and they wanted to throw us out, but it was a big group of kids, so they mm -hmm. couldn't. Uh, but he got involved now with Rhea Epilepsy Care Centre as a child. He was doing community service there, working in their farm, working with uh, the, pay, the residents and so on, doing uh, toiletry drives and donations and so on. Um, the next project that comes up now is very big in our country. It's our third one. It's a Purple Day. It's global effort, seven continents. And it, the founder is a young girl called uh, Cassidy Megan, and she's nine years old. She's now in her late teens. Mm. So we have this in South Africa. We hosted here at Mushroom Park on the 25th, a day before the 26th, the global day mm. of March. Yeah. And the reason for that is nobody can walk on a Monday. You're at school and work. Mm. So we'll have this at Mushroom Park, Hoppers 9 to Hoppers 12. And the main objective of the event? Raising awareness about epilepsy. So those who are coming to this event mostly are the scouts, because their color, their brand is purple. So the scouts will be doing the community service. You don't pay entrance fee, everybody brings toiletries. We do a massive drive, uh, including the community, including those. Her home will come and they support us. We'll have Rhea, we'll have South African uh, epilepsy um, a branch, which is Gedult, and we have um, Butterbilling. Mm. So when we do that uh, fundraiser of all those toiletries, it'll be massive containers. They are distributed and given to those four homes I've just mentioned, the two hostels and the two homes. That's what Maximilian and I do. Well, Nebuchadnezzar, <coughs> it's said that you support, you know, these yes. kind of events. Yes. But yeah. who supports you? <laughs> we do. <laughs> People like Tanya. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, at the moment, it's, it's a big uh, struggle yeah. uh, for Simul Law. We haven't fu uh, been funded yet. Yeah. Uh, everything, like, we depend on the kids' grant. And then, you know, uh, as, as much as the parents also depend on the grant, you know, what are we going to get? It's a serious struggle because, yeah, mm. everything is like you need to ask some people for help, you know, yeah. and then it's not something that you, you'll enjoy. It's, right. it's tough. Mm. Well, let's hope there's it's people tough. watching out there who uh, they will be, will be more sympathetic up. towards the yes. course, which, which is a good, good one anyway. Yeah. What? Debochang Ramushu and Tanya van Heren? I can only wish you well. Thank well, you very you much. Thank you. Oh, we have to see you at the walk. All right. No, I definitely <laughs> walk up. With a purple shirt. With a pu you have to wear lots of purple <laughs> oh, yeah, of and course, bring a toiletry, please. That's a deal. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank time you. for a quick break. When Thank we come you. back, we talk yes. impact of epilepsy. Please stay with us. so good nothing else can replace just your slightest embrace and if you only would be my own for the rest of my day I will whisper this phrase my darling Ceci Pom if we're talking health, then let's talk seriously.
Welcome back and thank you so much for staying with us. If you've just joined us, we're talking epilepsy. And with me in studio is Prof. Girish Moody, Head of Neurology at West University. And we're joined by two uh, other special guests, Sulise Campbell-Smith. Um, and Sulise Campbell-Smith is with her daughter, Sansha, the queen of this show for today. <laughs> Welcome, you two. Thank you so much. All right. Yeah. Before we start discussing and learning more about, you know, Sulis and our queen for today, let's take Portia on the line from Pretoria. Portia, welcome. Is Portia there? Portia is not there. All right. Okay. But perhaps let's, let's just go back to you, Prof. You know, um, that issue about the home for disabled children yeah, yeah. and, you know, children with epilepsy, I just want us to clear that. Yeah. That does it mean that epilepsy results no. in disability? No, 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 no. So I, I think she was, uh, I forget her name, but she did say the, it correctly yeah. that they're dealing with children who have what we would call debilities or disabilities, yeah. right? But who also suffer from epilepsy. All right. Okay. And it's, and so it's not the other, the way, other around. way around. Okay. So right. someone with, you know, some kind of bad anoxic or, you know, bad injury to the brain during birth who has yeah. cerebral palsy can have a risk, higher risk for epilepsy. Right. So I think that's the important difference. Okay. Because it ties into what we're talking about now. We're talking impact that yeah. epilepsy does tie has. Into the impact. You know? Yes. Uh, are there long term? Uh, issues with epilepsy, long-term complications, if you can Okay, so that. the majority, no. Right. Right, the majority live, grow old, make babies, do all those things that we right. all do, right? Right. right? And But you're going to get that small percentage where there will be issues. Yeah. And it's generally in that 20% where we find causes. Right. Right. Okay. And so we, we, we have to be clear on this. It is, that stigma must go. Right. And if you have epilepsy, you're going to have a disability, you're going to be mentally incapacitated, right. you're going to be bordered and all those things. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's get on a, a personal account from people that are affected. Let's first start picking, st talking to Sulis. Sulis, just tell us about your story. Okay, I myself was diagnosed with epilepsy in 2008. And nobody knew about it in my family. And we got it, and I got it, and I had my own child with it. I've got two children. Mm. The one I had before I was diagnosed, mm. and then Sancha was born prem. Mm. In, and two years after she, um, two years ago actually, she was diagnosed at school. She had a fit, and the school also didn't know what to do. Mm. Like everybody else, nobody actually explains to people about epilepsy. They all think. It's all heat stroke or something else. Mm. So we took Sancho to hospital. She was immediately put on an EEG and immediately they picked it up. It's actually while she sleeps. Mm. Her mm. brain does not shut off at all. Mm. Okay. I'll come back, I'll come back to that because I'd like a comment from you sure. about diagnosis, uh, how easy it is you know, to diagnose epilepsy in children yeah. and the role of the EEG and so on. But let's talk to Portia. Portia is back with us. Portia, welcome. I have a guy. You're 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 a guy. you all right, what's my treatment? All right, okay, all right, thank you. We'll, we'll ask the, the expert what she's basically saying. She, she has epilepsy, um, but she's not able to get around. She's not able to do her normal you know, chores in the house and work in the garden and so on. She, she has been on treatment, but it doesn't appear that you know, the treatment that she's on is assisting her. Yeah, difficult one. She really needs to be, you know, go back to her doctor, Absolutely. refer to a specialist, find out what's going on, because yeah. that's not the norm. Right. Okay. So, so, people, so if people are well controlled, they yeah, stay... Yeah, yeah. No, no, they, they function normally. Right. You can drive... You can go to universities, you can do all those things. Right. I mean, 
there should be no reason why an epilepsy sufferer would be confined to the house. Okay. Yeah. Well, I hope she's listening there. I'm yeah, sure she'll go back I, I, to her. There may be her some clinic. reason, we, but uh, she really needs to see the doctor. All right. So here's a classical example. Sansha, we're going to talk to her now. She, she had one fit and went to hospital and had an EEG immediately diagnosed with epilepsy. Is that the norm? Uh, in children, more or less. So it's interesting if you take the EEG or electroencephalogram, it has a, a sensitivity which is quite, not, not enough, but it's specific. Mm. So what I'm trying to say is if you do an EEG randomly on someone, your chances of picking up epilepsy in someone who's had a fit, who's coming for investigations, mm. 60 to 70 percent. So low sensitivity, but if you identify it, it's highly specific, so yeah. high specificity. Mm. In children, that figure is a bit higher. So okay. we, we tend to pick it up much, much easier in children. All right, let's talk to our queen. Sansha, how are you? Good, and you? Okay, how old are you, by the way? Six. Six. And why are you with us today? Because I have epilepsy. Uh-huh. And who told you you have epilepsy? Mostly the doctors. Uh-huh. And what does it mean for you to have epilepsy? It makes me feel sad and my mom and dad and brother. Is it? And w do your friends at school know that you have epilepsy? My old school, yes. Your old school. And what do you tell them? I just keep quiet. Mm -hmm. All right. And who gives you med medicines for epilepsy? My dad. Okay. And you're going to tell your friends at school that there's nothing wrong with you. You're just like them. The only difference is that you have epilepsy and yep. you're taking medicines for it. And you're okay? Okay, yes. let's hear from mom. I mean, how, how do you deal with... She, she talks about being a little bit sad about this. You know, she's actually a very strong little girl because yeah. she, if she has a fit, she normally has it while she sleeps. Yeah. But it normally happens when she gets very excited about something. Right. Then I know that night, okay, we must keep an eye on her. She mm -hmm. actually only moved into her own room this year mm -hmm. because we, as parents, were very scared of moving her out because she gets it while she's sleeping. Right. But she gets, she's actually quite, she tells everybody that she has a fit and she knows, okay, you need to turn me on my side and don't put stuff in my mouth and just leave me till I'm done and I'll wake up and I'll be fine. That's so good. she actually does know what to do, especially with me as well. If I will yeah. fall down and because I get uh, grandma, I yeah. get it bad. Yeah. She's the one that will turn me on my side and sit with me while her dad helps me to get, recover. Okay, so Sancha, tell me. Do you play with other children at school? Do you play all games with them? Yes. Are there games that you told you can't play? No. So you play any game? you just like yes. anybody else, eh? Yeah. All right. Mom, are there any pr special precautions that you take, perhaps? What, do you, what message do you give to the teachers at school? At the school, I tell them just to keep an eye on her because of, especially when she falls asleep, mm -hmm. that is when they have to... Just keep an eye. But now with being in preschool, they don't sleep during the day. Mm. But when she was in um, daycare and aftercare and that, she falls asleep and they all, they, she normally sleeps with the teachers. Mm. But even a new teacher at school now, she sits right by the teacher and the teacher keeps an eye on her. And she also said that Sancha does zonk out, that she will talk and all of a sudden she'll keep quiet. Right. So they do keep an eye on her and the people at school, all of them are very sweet with her, especially Sancha's. They don't let Sancha run around a lot because right. they do know if she gets too excited right. that it's going to happen. And she's also not allowed to be in the sun too long. Okay. So yeah. they do keep Let's an eye. And I have to say that the, the school is very good with that. All right. Let's take Lebohang on the line. Lebohang, welcome. Hello. Hello, Lebohang. Lebohang. Uh, he has a since uh, 94. Right. So now, Matatina, in Chasela, so Maracita, my treatment, and then can I appeal him a tram rate? So we see you as the doctor saying, Banjo is dangerous more than Saturday. So can you go to our doctor and just what to do because I'm on a treatment? Okay. Well, Lebohang uh, has been epileptic, well, has been living with epilepsy since 1994. She's on Epilim 300. And, um, 
even though she's okay during the day, the problem is at night. She gets her convulsions at night, and her doctors told her, well, it's, it's dangerous for her to have convulsions at night. She, know, she wants to know what to do. Medication adjustment, right. basically. So Needs a checkup. Right. I, I, the, the, she seems okay. Yeah. She seems reasonably well controlled. There's a little bit of a issue with her control, and right. I think uh, adjustment of the dose or introduction of a new medicine at night yeah. may solve the problem. Right. And in terms of just to round off now, in terms of you know the impact of epilepsy on children. I think the message is, here's a child with yeah, epilepsy and lives good, a completely good. normal life. Excellent. This is a good choice. Right. <laughs> well, Sancha and uh, Mark, yeah. thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for inviting us. all the best in the future. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right, folks, well, time for another quick break. When we come back, we now talk treatment of epilepsy. Please stay with us. Well done. Shield Medical Scheme doesn't just cover you when you're ill, we'll help you stay well. I feel the real prison. <laughs> and it's nutritious and delicious. It's good, I really like it. celebrate being South African. We love our beer, we love our food, we love our music. So for knowing who are going, you must know where you come from. I'm excited uh, to be part of this this year. For all your travel trends, catch us every Sunday, 12 midday on Channel 404. MedShield Medical Scheme doesn't just cover you when you're ill. We'll help you stay well. The first thing that you want to do is make sure that there's no hazards uh, that may injure yourself or the patient. Uh, if there are any hazards, try and remove them. If you can't remove them, try and move the patient away from the hazards. Okay. Um, and then you want to make sure that they are able to protect themselves or you can protect their heads because when people have epileptic seizures, they, complete, they lose complete control of their body. Um, and one of the main things that gets hurt is their head. Okay, so try and uh, protect the head from hitting the ground. Okay. Um, after that, you want to place them in the recovery position. Uh, just this keeps the airway open and makes sure that they can maintain their own airway. Basically, the recovery position is turning them in a lateral uh, position, and that way if anything comes into their mouth or they start vomiting, uh, it can leave the mouth uh, by the force of gravity. Uh, after that, you want to call for an ambulance, call for help. Uh, anybody that's medically trained can, can help uh, further and prevent further seizures from occurring. You don't want to put anything in the person's mouth at all. Uh, usually if you put a spoon in the person's mouth or something hard in the person's mouth, uh, they, their jaws clench quite hard, so you can cause their teeth to break. So you want to avoid putting anything in the mouth. Um, rather just let, the, rather okay. just let them have the seizure and without uh, intervening too, too much. All right, so that's a few tips on what to do when you have, when you're faced with that situation of somebody having um, a fit. We still with us in, in the studio is Prof. Girish Muri, head of neurology at, at Wits University, and joining us now is Mr. Kandas Kandawire, who is a social worker with Epilepsy South Africa. Welcome to Health Talk. Uh, Thanks Kandawire. for having me, Doc. All right, uh, let's take Malishla on the line from Bloemfontein. Malishla, welcome. Hello, thank you. Hello, hello, Manishra. Your question or comment, please. Sir, Dr. Moody, my son started to have epilepsy epi epi when he was six months. Right. Mm, he started the seizure. Then it stopped when he was two years. Okay. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, on October, they stopped on giving him evidence, but there was no seizures till now. So I just want to know either it will start again because of he's on the medication for autism. Okay. Well, mm-hmm. brilliant question. Yes. This child has been epileptic uh, since six months, an epilim, totally uh, seizure-free now. Mm. She wants to know whether or not these seizures will come back because okay. this child is also on treatment for autism. Yeah, so the, this is that group that we get a bit nervous about where there may be an underlying developmental disorder because, remember, autism is also a developmental problem. Mm. So there is a risk. In this child, there will be a risk. She has to be monitored. Okay. So yeah. she, there's no reason for her to stop the no, treatment. No, no, no. She needs to no, no. just I think continue. continue continue monitoring. There may come a time when the doctor might decide, let's drop the doses, mm-hmm. she's well controlled, etc. Yeah. But the fact that there is some developmental thing going on there right. means your risk is a bit higher than we would be comfortable with. Right. So we've heard a lot about, you know, people uh, talking about treatment, this one being on this form of treatment, the other one being on this yeah. form of treatment. Let's talk principles of treatment for epilepsy. Okay, so in terms of principles of treatment, first things, you've got to make sure you've got the right diagnosis. Always good to get hard copy evidence, sometimes mm-hmm. difficult, but push as hard as you can to get the diagnosis so the patient is comfortable, you comfortable as a clinician, and you've identified the cause or the potentially no cause situation. So. In 2018, every patient with epilepsy or potential epilepsy should have an imaging scan of the brain, Mm. whether it's a CAT scan or an MRI scan, but it must be done. Mm. All those things need to be sorted out. Mm. Identify those treatable things, like in our country, especially in the Eastern Cape, where you have cysticycosis that may be the cause, completely treatable. If you have a guy who might have had syphilis, treatable. So get all those things sorted out. Mm. Once you've done that, then you have to treat the epilepsy, the fits, right? And we've got very good medicines now. I mean, the the armamentarium has grown over the past 20, 30 years. We used to have phenytoin or epineutin. We've evolved from that. It was a very impure drug, in my opinion. Lots of skin rashes, skin issues, dental issues, gum issues. And we've evolved from that. It's still a brilliant drug in terms of cost and efficacy. We've had phenobarb, which is still the cheapest and the most probably the most effective <laughs> anti-epilepsy drug, linked with a little bit of attention disorder in children, etc. Right. Lots of other side effects. But we've gone to the phase where we're getting purer and purer drugs. Mm. So the first line treatments these days, valproate and carbamazepine, mm. right? And then there's lamotrigin, topamirate, uh, you also get, uh, what's a new one, Capra, um, yeah. Leveri, Setem, all of those. But bottom so line is that there's an array there's of... An array of things. M- m- your doctor or your neurologist has to identify your type of epilepsy, mm. classify the epilepsy, mm. look at the EEG, see whether the pattern fits in with this or that, and then choose the right drug for you. Do you stay on medication for life? Okay. So if you take that generalized epilepsy group, minimum two years. Minimum. Right? Then you review the situation. And some of these guys, now this is an important point I'm going to make. 60 to 70% will be cured. In other words, their seizures will stop. After stop two years. After two years. But you have to be on treatment, you've got to do your treatment properly, go for your follow ups properly, etc., etc. And there's a very good chance you can be in inverted commas cured because you can always trigger it if you do the wrong things again. Mm. Right. So there is, it, it, there is good news. It's okay. not like, you know, you know, I think we must get away from the fact, and unfortunately we stuck with this, yeah. that you have epilepsy, you stuck. You, okay. you like, you know, write off. There's no such thing. All right. Let's take Estelle from Bloemfontein on the line. Estelle, welcome. Hi, good morning, good doctors. How are you? We're good. How are you, Estelle? Fine, thanks for yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, Oh, doctor, I would like to ask Dr. Moody. Um, my baby girl was about a month old when she fell down from the couch. Um, and then one evening, um, she was just staring at the ceiling. And for about a minute and a half, she came by. 
um, I took her to Impangini Hospital and they told me it was diarrhea, but it wasn't the case. So I took her back from hospital and I took her home and um, she couldn't really sit. And then the one day she just started turning blue and no breathing. So what happened afterwards, um, the hospital in Bloemfontein put her on um, Epilim 250, I think, because she started having like four to five seizures a day. All right. Yeah. And um, they changed the medication to Tegretor. So now she's having blackouts, but um, she's losing concentration. Um, she will start asking you a question, and she doesn't remember what she, she was trying okay. to do. All right. Okay. Let's, let's, let's try and get a response. Thank you so much for that brilliant question. We're going to get a response whilst you're still trying to collect your thoughts. <laughs> yeah. Let me speak to uh, Kandas uh, quickly. Talk about, you know, what do you do in terms of support for people with epilepsy from a social work perspective? Doctor, from our perspective is that, uh, you know, sub providing support to people with epilepsy is very critical. Mm. Prof alluded to the fact that there's a lot of stigma, you know, attached to the condition. And there's a lot of fear, you know, from people with epilepsy and from the people around that particular person. So it is important, you know, after having understanding, you know, the, the, the definition of epilepsy, what causes epilepsy, what triggers epilepsy, the treatment that one needs to be on mm. and to manage the condition. It is therefore Im important, you know, for us as social workers to go out there in the community mm. to provide education and awareness and create awareness around the condition. So this is what you do mainly uh, within Epilepsy South Africa? Yeah? It, it's one of you know, the, the, the key performance areas okay. because we also provide you know, training to yeah. people with epilepsy. We provide training yeah. uh, to the corporate sector so that uh, employees, uh, employers out there understand okay. the condition. Very, very, very important. We run out, we've run out of time. Very quick response to... Uh, very, very poorly managed, needs to see a specialist neurologist, right. adult or pediatric, right. and then can sort this out. Okay. I hope nice, short and sweet. Sweet. Well, thank mm. you so much, uh, Prof. You. Girish Muri, Head of Neurology at Bates yeah. University, Kandas Kandawire, Thanks, Social Doc. Worker at Epilepsy South Africa. Well, folk, that's how we come to the end of our show today. And thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for all the questions. Uh, I'm Dr. Musil Daung. We're back with you next week, same time. And until then... Please do take care. If we're talking health, then let's talk seriously. Shield, embracing our members in good health since 1968.
Over half the world's population lives in cities. Every month, five million people move from the countryside to a city somewhere in the world. Cities shape how we eat, sleep, and live. And city lifestyles are leading to a disease that can be devastating, even life-threatening. It is an emergency in slow motion. cities that help us live healthier lives. Urban diabetes is not inevitable. Two point one billion people worldwide are obese or overweight. That's thirty percent of the world's population. Today we are in a war against diabetes. Let's be very frank. The problem is that we may create cities where the life is unhealthy. It's all very nice to say what is wrong. I think there comes a time when also we have to find out as to what are we going to do about it. Yeah.